But um, yeah, thanks to Mike. Um, he said he felt like the warm-up act. I certainly feel like the guy that's kind of playing at five in the morning after the headliner after that talk. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes, shall we? Right. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a developer advocate for Sony Type. Um, I've worked as a developer for about 10 years, as well as kind of the DJing and the running and stuff. But um, kind of been interested in cybersecurity for just as long. Um, I've got postgrad certificate in it. I'm not an Australian rugby player. That's completely different. Dan Con. He should change his name. He's three years younger than me. I had it first. Um, the slides will be available if you want to kind of link up afterwards. Those are all the links. Um, kind of want to start. Oh, I've forgotten one thing. But that's all right. We'll go on with it. Um, I wanted to start with kind of my OWASP journey because well, I'm here, right? I don't really do AppSec for a living. I did have a baseball cap from when I was doubling in my pocket, so I was going to do the rest of the talk. But yeah, how do you do, fellow AppSec kids? You know, that's how I feel at the moment, kind of standing here. Um, it started about 10 years ago, three months, well, nine years and three, three months ago, I got hacked. And um, that's the main reason I know about OWASP, because I was sat there not really knowing what to do, <laughs> three months in and seeing a defacement of a website. And um, having to kind of do instant response on the fly. Has anyone done instant response here? I'm guessing quite a lot of people, yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. And if you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to do instant response, it goes really badly. Um, so after that, which was quite some time, I found out, you know, I, I was in a position where kind of everybody above me didn't actually know what secure coding was either because 10 years ago it wasn't really that well known about, um, rightly or wrongly. <laughs> um, so I found the OWASP top 10 and started thinking, well, how am I going to actually be a better developer? Because it's kind of my job to, right? And that's kind of it. Wherever I've kind of worked, I've kind of wanted to try and bring in secure coding or, you know, in, used OWASP's app as a vulnerability scanner or, you know, tried to look at, you know, dependency management with, with dependency track. And, you know, over time, these, the, you know, you, you start, like, learning more and more and more. And, you know, over the, uh, you know, a decade, you, you tend to learn a little bit about it. So I feel a little bit more confident talking. Um, but the main reason I know a lot about OWASP is the beer farmers, um, who, when lockdown happened, they did InfoSec Happy Hour. I think Sam spoke for definitely one of them. Um, and quite a few others. Um, so I think like, you know, where you have the thing where, um, you know, to raise a child, it takes a village. Well, to raise a security conscious developer, it takes Knapsack Village. And kind of these are the people that day in, day out, most of them have worked with, well, two of them I've worked with on a daily basis, and the rest of them have just been incredibly kind with their time, um, mentoring me, um, sometimes just giving great advice, um, you know, on multiple occasions. And so, yeah, let's say thanks. I know m many of them are OWASP members as well. So, what is threat modeling? Who doesn't know what threat modeling is in the room? Anyone? Cool, there are a few. Right, okay, so we'll go through very briefly, I uh, found this article, um, article, first paragraph on the OWASP uh, description of threat modeling. Uh, Victoria Drake, threat modeling works to identify, communicate, understand threats and mitigation within the context of protecting something value. Um, you know, so basically that's it. Well, that's all you're doing. You're trying to protect something. So as Mike was saying earlier, you know, you've got data. You know, that's actually probably the most valuable thing you need. Um, everything else, yeah, is, is still important. You've got to fix vulnerabilities. It's, you know, there's, well, we'll go on to that later. But, you know, on the most part, you want to protect data, you want to protect assets. Um, four main questions. Threat Modeling Manifesto came out a few years ago. Um, again, another OWASP thing. Um, four main questions you ask. What are we working on? What can go wrong with what we're working on? What are we going to do about it? And then at the end of it, did we do a good enough job? And if you didn't, let's go back to question one. Um, and yeah, you know, it's done with every, you know, uh, you know, as diverse a thought as possible. You know, everybody has different ways. You know, if you have actually people in the threat model that aren't just security engineers, you get very different set of knowledge around how things work. You know, I think, I think um, quite a few times I've done this, you know, we've, we've done threat modeling as a group and had like, you know, somebody that's kind of new to de development and they'll bring out some really good 
insights into what a system does because they've just gone through a, a UD program or boot camp and they aren't really stuck in you know, a, a way of working that they've been working in for like five or six years and kind of making excuses for things that are like, oh, well, that's just the way it is, you know, so we don't really need to worry about that too much. Um, and yeah, security should be for everyone. So that was a bit of a ramble, wasn't it? So now we get on to what we're actually meant to be talking about. So um, modeling threats in the open source. So open source has got loads of threats. Um, you know, one, we consume loads of it. Um, Supply chain attacks seem to be increasing like, well, 742%, that's a huge increase. And even if you, what you build in the open source community is really secure, chances are you're pulling in something that, due to a transitive dependency, you're actually bringing in a vulnerability of some kind. Further to that, <laughs> there's legislation in the US, in the executive order, and also, hopefully, that it will change by the time it gets published, but the Cyber Resiliency Act, which is kind of making, or well, suggesting that maybe open source people could be liable for, you know, what they build, you know, which we all know, normally the warranty on these things is as is, because it's doing a good job, right? It's helping people. So I think, you know, in some ways, if this legislation goes as is, we definitely need to think about these things. And what else is the problem with open source? Well, it's very difficult to model, because I think, um, again, you know, <laughs> I'd love that you're actually a starter at all, because it's like, oh, yeah, that. Um, so, um, you know, in, as you say, like traditional architectures, you know, you have like MVC models in software, you know, very well understood. Open source, you might one minute be in an MVC module, you might have your library pulled into some bigger library, you might have a Kubernetes cluster. You don't actually really know what, your hardware is underneath. You just know that your product's being used, and how far do you kind of model around that? You can't, right? It's kind of a bit impossible to cater for every single use case that your product would, or not product, but you know, your project would be envisaged in. So on top of that, you know, yeah, so no, actually, all through it. So how kind of, so what we did was uh, with one particular open source project, which is used in a uh, CI, CD kind of pipeline, um, they were trying to pass um, a CNCF graduation and they got very far and actually it's a very secure system. It's just that what they maybe had, you yeah, know, they had kind of not really identified everything really that they could have. So, how do you find a way of trying to explain what, what threat modeling is, try and get people engaged, and you know, have, you know, have, have them participate, and also save a lot of time because it's people's spare time that they're doing this in, right? Well, tools. So what tools do we have? We have like the ASP Threat Dragon, we have uh, PyTM, and we also have not an OWASP product, but it's the one we use, which is Fragile. Um, any one of these could have been used. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it, it was literally trying to think of why we actually chose one. We wanted to have architecture dry style diagrams for the data flows, because that's where they you know, felt more comfortable. You know, as a developer, I am used to seeing an architecture diagram with a certain way, way it works. I found, personally, Threat Dragon didn't quite do that, but actually it's still very clear. It's a, it's, a, it's a different way of doing it. It's actually, in some ways, very clear. It's just for us to start, we kind of chose a different way. Um, we also wanted an update mechanism that felt comfortable for developers to use, um, which I think, you know, um, yeah, so we were looking at something that kind of could do with code. Um, and we wanted a data flow diagram to show what the data flowing and what level of risk then to each component you got based on where the flow went through. So we chose Fragile. Um, so why am I an OWASP thing talking about Fragile? Well, it's actually quite good. Um, a few years ago, Christian Schneider brought it out. Um, he I think he demoed it in uh, DEF CON. Um, it uses YAML to kind of model the architecture. And I think it's a really good use case for that. You know, it's highly updatable, it's very quick. Um, and you can also have the relative attacker attractiveness for each module, um, which allows you, once you see the percentages, you can then see the data flow and it says, well, this 
needs looking at, the way that you're connecting to the different elements is, you know, this, this is what you should uh, be looking at. So, you know, the higher the RAA in theory, the more interesting it is to compromise an asset. Um, it's written in Go. Um, it can basically be run on a command line as a REST server, docking container. Um, you know, it's very flexible. Um, so this is kind of what we ended up with. Um, I say, you know, you code with YAML, you have, um, you know, you put each of kind of these elements in. So here we have like a build time boundary. Within a boundary, you'll put the particular elements. So here we have like a Git client. We have the build pipeline through GitHub Actions. Um, ooh, over here, we have, um, you know, like Kubernetes cluster within um, the host. We also have, you know, the Argo CD namespace and then the rough Kubernetes network, what we think people might use. I mean, it might not be that. It might be that we've made some huge assumptions, but you've got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and this is essentially, this is what we've got at the moment. And it's taken a couple of months to get here. Um, we've been meeting kind of every couple of weeks. We say, right, what have we got? We have some risks. They are output as a PDF along with this. Um, That's what we like about Threadjar is that this is kind of generated, self-generated from basically from the YAML. So we don't, we didn't draw any of this. This is all done by that. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. Um, what are the benefits? Well, because the data model is an image, you can kind of put it in a project, right? You can just stick it in there. Wouldn't it be really cool, like we've done this for one project and it's taken quite a lot of time. Wouldn't it be good to template this? Wouldn't it be good if or various organizations could kind of have like maybe a dot security, you know, you have like a dot GitHub folder, I think, for like license information. What if there was a dot security folder just for open source projects where they could put their threat model in, they could put, you know, their risk assessment, they could put all their information that's with that project. So the security conscious around us could actually say, well, well okay, yeah, you've actually put some thought in it. Now, I don't think any of these would be perfect because it's the onus is on it's on developers that might not really even know anything about security, but at least it's a start of trying to get people to think about security a bit more than maybe what they are already. So then we look at that and we go, well, that's the kind of state of where we are at the moment. You know, are we doing a good enough job on Argo? Well, I have no idea. Hopefully, the, you know, as for a wider community, there's a lot of, you know, OWASP is one of kind of many organizations doing very similar things. Um, you know, I think the BCS are now getting involved in trying to, uh, they have a very good uh, cybersecurity uh, chapter. Uh, NIST, obviously, NCSC doing very good work. Um, and I think, like, together, we could actually, you know, with a lot of collaboration, and um, allowing for these uh, threat models to be within uh, open source projects, you know, together we could actually make a real, real good start. Why is that? Well, oh, okay, I missed a slide. That's great. I've got to stop doing this. Right. What you should have seen there was a graph that said, well, what do we know actually can can really benefit from developers? And one particular thing is code reviews are actually one of the you know from the Open SSF scorecard. Uh, algorithm, we found that um, code reviews are actually incredibly useful as a way of um, stopping um, bugs, basically, and bad vulnerabilities. So, if you think of threat modeling as a security code review, you know, you're just asking the same questions, really. Have you, you know, instead of have you coded it correctly, it's, well, have you actually, you know, is this secure enough? Have you got TLS 1.3 there instead of 1.2? Are you, do you need to encrypt at rest? Or is, you know, what's your other solution, you know? So, and then having this kind of one-to-one -one or, you know, group-to-many kind of discussion, having a template for it allows people that are outside of application security to kind of start that. Now, some of you might think, well, that's not a good thing. We, we, wanna, we wanna meet people, actually. And I'm not saying that it's a substitute, but, I've worked in a place, I've worked in a few places, in fact, where the application security team might be three or four people, 
and the development team's about 100 or 50 or an incredibly large amount of people that you're never going to meet on a day-to-day -day basis. You're never going to teach them one-to-one. -one. Well, you might do once every two years as it cycles as you go through each large company's project. And then by the time you got to the end one, you realise that you've got to do it all again because time's moved on, things have changed. All of those things that you raised Jira tickets for are still there. <laughs> and I'm not saying that that's a developer's fault either. I'm saying, you know, a lot of the things, it's a, it's a mashup between security and productivity. It always has been, right? So where do we go beyond this? Well, use templates to help raise the alarm and be able to, you know, essentially have, you know, start the discussion around what application security is. Use loads of tools to help. You know, I think that's why I started, right? Is to give free tools. Um, you know, there are many free ones. There's many open source ones, you know. Um, and, you know, that's right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> I don't know why there was. Sorry, I'm babbling. Um, so more complex projects should have someone that's kind of application security trained to kind of help them through it as well. So I think there's also maybe a call to, for application security professionals to devote a little bit more time. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room actually devotes loads of time, so I'm not like, you know, it's not a dig. It's just saying, you know, I think like when you have projects that are responsible for huge swathes of, you know, finance or, you know, different huge companies that we should probably pay attention to those a bit more. Um, and if you're not in security, everyone in the project should be questioning your open source projects. You know, is this what you expect? Run unit tests on, you know, so if, I think like some open source things I've used have been around text translation to find like from project to project, they just change. Well, why is that? Well, because the vote around what was good has now moved on, but you weren't part of that vote. So how do you know it's actually still useful for you? You know, run unit tests on your, in, run integration tests on your integrations. You know, know that it's actually, is it safe? Are you, are you satisfied? And if it's not, then you can contribute and make it better, right? So I think that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>